Companies are facing three big issues right now. One, a lot of their employees are disengaged. Two, a lot of those employees are looking for other work. And three, it's getting harder and harder to find good people. So this positive spin right now is that we have several different generations all working together alongside. We have neuroscience now for the first time to really begin to understand where trust resides in the brain. And if we understand that part, we can actually create conversations that make that kind of chemical reaction take place. And then three, we've also got the ability to measure human behavior in ways we never did before. And for the first time, we can actually start to make the argument, how does training and development and coaching actually create better engagement, more productivity, uh, less waste, and overall bottom line results. You create bottom line results by attracting and retaining top talent, developing learning cultures, tapping into individual team and organizational purpose, which creates aligned engagement. And aligned engagement creates bottom line results. We help the individual, the team, and the organization identify its purpose and align them all together. Your team does not retain its learning through knowledge. Read a book, watch a TED Talk, see a speaker. They retain their learning through an experience. And that's what we do at Mission Facilitators. We create experience. We create the space for people to take the knowledge that they have and to be able to translate it into something much more visceral. We're very much a learn by doing organization and that's what we do with you and your teams. We believe that transformation is a journey and our work is inspired by age old wisdom combined with modern day understanding of adult learning and neuroscience. We would love to embark on that journey with you. Thank you so much for that. Great video. No, you're very welcome. We had that done by a local company in Bend, and we're still tweaking it a bit, but I think it's going to be a good way of kind of telling our story. So thanks for showing that. Yes, thank you. So let's talk a little bit about, here's our first slide here. Thank you. Okay. So please talk a little bit about the leadership development curriculum and um, the expectations for the upcoming courses. You bet. I know we've got three, Melanie, we're going to talk about today. And just to highlight everybody who happens to be on this call, maybe the first thing I'd ask you to think about is, you know, you've obviously taken an hour of your day or 45 minutes to be a part of this webinar. What is one thing that you would hope to come away from this? Is there a particular tip or tool that would make your leadership more effective, whether it's a student, whether it's a teacher, whether you're working for a company, whether you own a company, you know, what's the burning platform? And maybe we can get a little bit of traction on this in a short amount of time. As this little video had just sort of described, I think that there's three things that we're sort of facing right now in terms of learning and development. There's three headwinds, but also there's three really big opportunities. Um, the headwinds that I see is that we have um, really VUCA, ADD, and multi-generational employees. Let me explain that. VUCA stands for volatility, uncertainty, chaos, and ambiguity. It was a military term that's been used for years, and we're beginning to now hear it in the business sector. And basically what it's describing is this incredible amount of constant change that's taking place, not only in business, but in all aspects of society. And they've been measuring this and they're saying that this particular type of chaos that this term indicates is happening more often to the point where it's almost like the new normal. So it's very disruptive and obviously people have a hard time dealing with massive amounts of change. The other headwind I think we deal with is what I kind of call is this, this ADD mindset. Uh, we have so many billions of bits of information coming at us every day, every hour, that most of our attention is trying to be able to ignore most of it and focus on just a few things that are a priority. And so it's really becoming that our attention span is getting many, uh, much more short. Uh, and we finish the day, whether it's at school or at work or what have you, and wonder what is it that we actually got accomplished? And that is due to the fact that we're distracted so much and then we're not present by very, with very many things. And so this ADD kind of mindset is really becoming really uh, a metaphor for this attention deficit that's taking place. And then the third thing that I think is also unique to this kind of time and place in our society is, is we have for the first time in a long time, or maybe even ever, we have potentially grandfather working alongside with granddaughter in the same company. 
and each of these different types of generations, whether they be um, uh, the, uh, the Gen Xers, or the Gen Yers, or the Baby Boomers, or what have you, they all have their unique perspective on what they need. They all have a different type of way in which they make decisions, how they like to receive information, how they like to give information, how, what motivates them, how they view work, how they self-actualize, all those sort of things. And they all are coming together in this big, huge employee soup, and we as leaders are trying to find a way to navigate around that. So these are pretty big challenges. However, on the other side of the ledger, I think, in terms of what's going on, is that we have really a very big opportunity here that I think is unprecedented. And I think that those things that we're seeing now in terms of the work that I'm seeing and reading about is that we alerted to this in the video, is that neuroscience is really now beginning to be a tool for leadership development and employee development. And we're finally being able to understand where does trust reside in the brain where does fear reside in the brain? And couldn't we create intentionally conversations that will allow people to trust us and to elevate the conversation? Uh, there was a quote that I once heard that said that friendships, families, teams, companies, organizations, and even countries grow and die one conversation at a time. And if that's the case, and I do think there's something to that quote, then our job as leaders and employees is hopefully to, that we can evolve and master the art of the conversation. And then the other thing that I think is really different now that we haven't had in a long time, and I certainly have dealt with this, and I'm sure Melanie, you have as well, and anybody who's in the industry of learning and development is, you always ask the question, I'm glad we had this offsite, I'm glad we did this training, but how do we measure results? What's the ROI? And especially with people who are more um, factual in their thinking, they wanna know, if I spend this amount of money, am I gonna get some sort of an outcome that makes sense? I think that what's happening now is that there's a lot more emphasis in being able to develop tools to measure learning effectiveness. In fact, our team right now is going through a training program specifically on that. It's called Coaching for ROI, and it's providing us uh, some brand new tools around being able to connect the dots between human development, leadership development, and how it's affecting teams, productivity, engagement, retention, even things like healthcare. And we're being able to have a line of sight to those things that are financial in nature. It's not just a soft skill. These are actually crucial business-related activities that will move the needle. And then I think the last thing that's really an amazing opportunity right now that we're all sort of facing is around this need for purpose. Um, you know, when my father grew up and he went to school and he went to the uh, Minneapolis Star Tribune and was a reporter for 35 years, purpose wasn't as big of a deal back then. It was a job you had, you had a duty, you wanted to support your family. But now I think a lot of people, certainly the younger generation coming into the workforce, they want to self-actualize. They want work to be not just a paycheck, but they want to do something that is valuable and meaningful and maybe even changes their community and the world. And on the other end of the, uh, the, the age spectrum, baby boomers are now saying, you know what, I don't know if I want to retire quite yet. You know, so if I do want to stay in the workforce, maybe it's half time or what have you, I want to do it, do something that's meaningful and purposeful. So this third piece that I think is a unique opportunity is around people are wanting to do meaningful work. They want their work to be purpose driven. And so that's really what we are often all about is around creating purpose driven leaders, teams, and organizations. It's not just because it's a trend. I think it's because it's something that we've always stood for. So that's kind of an overview of who we are, and we were just delighted to be able to provide these three classes. This first one that Melanie has got the, uh, the slide up for around coaching skills. Um, coaching, when I first started, um, and by the way, everybody, I'm going to try to provide at least a couple of tips that be doable and actionable as a result of this. So um, that's my goal here, in addition to just kind of giving you a sense about what these, these courses are about. So I started coaching uh, literally 25 years ago. And it was back in the day when nobody really knew what coaching was. It was still associated with, you know, uh, football and basketball and so forth. And I remember I went to a radio um, show and I was asked to be a guest. And this was up in Tacoma, Washington. We started our business up in Seattle. And the gal said to me before we went into the booth, she says, well, you know, Dean, I'm really excited about this, but I really don't want to know anything about your company. I just want to be very extemporaneous and, cre and creative and off the cuff. I said, okay, fine. So we go into the booth and uh, they close the door and we get the mics all set up and they've got this red light that eventually says on air. So we know that everything is live. And she turns to me and she says, hi, we've got Dean Newland here with Mission Facilitators International. So Dean, tell me what professional sports team do you coach? 
And at that point, I had to sort of delicately uh, redirect her to something that was not about sports, but was about business. And I think that coaching right now is ubiquitous. After 25 years, it has become such a common practice in business that it is being used uh, so much and so often which is wonderful. It is not a trend. It is not a fad. Yeah, I think it's here to stay. And I think the reason why it is, is because a continuous check-in with your coach that allows for you to be able to master something and that kind of neutral support, which I'll talk about here in a minute. One of the things, however, is that everybody pretty much, because it's not a regulated industry, can call themselves a coach. I just was talking to somebody yesterday, doing some work with the Mayo Clinic, and somebody was saying, yeah, there's my friend wants to become a coach, and I was uh, asking them questions about the process they go through, and they really didn't have much of a background. They just thought they were a pretty good listener. Um, right now, the industry does not provide you know, that kind of requirement that you have to be licensed by the state. Anybody can call themselves a coach. So it's wonderful that we've got that kind of understanding of the benefits in many ways of coaching, but the problem is, is that there's a lot of misunderstanding about what coaching is and what it's not. And this course is actually developed really after 25 years in my life. Plus, I partnered with somebody who has about 30 years work in terms of coaching and providing coaching training and was actually on the board of directors for the International Coach Federation, which is really now the gold standard for our industry. And this program is really set up with those ethics and those standards and those processes in mind so that we are aligned with the best of the best when it comes to standards. And so that's what this program is really um, Found, the foundation is really based on those, those standards so that when we get into a program, you know you're getting uh, some really good content. Um, if you want to move to the next slide here, that'd be fine here, Melanie, but I wanted to also say when it comes to coaching is that we really believe in everything that we do that you can't necessarily just read a book. We believe that you need to be able to have a visceral experience about it. So when you go through this coaching program with us, you're going to be coaching people by the end of the day. You're not going to just be reading a book and sitting in the back of the room, you know, wondering what your Facebook page has just said. You're actually going to get up and actually have a visceral experience around coaching. It's like we're going to get you in the water. You're going to start swimming before the end of the day. And that's the only way we think that you can really master anything is by that experience. And that's true whether it's this class or the other two classes is that it's very experiential. It's taking cutting edge uh, techniques and tools, combining that with something that you can actually practice it that day versus hope that someday you can actually apply that tip. So the coaching process that we have um, developed and that we are aligning with the ICF is really, again, using some of these new cutting edge understandings around how the brain works and how can we create trusting relationships and how we can create that foundation. And that's really what we think is going to be part of what sets this apart. If you would move to the next slide, uh, Melanie, as well, I can also t share with you that we have this um, five-step process that we walk our coaches through in terms of them being able to become better at. These are not new concepts, but these are things that the distinctions and the understanding, the awareness, to be able to raise up your ability to have those kind of conversations is really what the coach into a great coach. So we really start with this, you know, the age old um, idea about listening. And we would really do a lot of work on this, but listening is the foundation. This is where we create the trust. And so as a tip for those of you who are listening in, you know, next time that you're in a conversation with somebody where you really want to develop a better connection, listen without judgment versus listen for when they're going to finally stop and you can say what you want to say. Listen as an exercise to being present. Listen to be able to understand that person's point of view, whether or not you agree with it. If you can start to change the dance by how we communicate with that person or how you communicate with that person, I think you'll start to see a different kind of relationship come about. Everybody has to feel understood in order for that relationship to take them to the next step. We also go into another skill around asking, don't telling, which is really another way of saying in, in a brief way, um, ask without judgment. So that if you can ask questions without, excuse me, ask without answer, excuse me. So asking questions without any answer in your mind. That's the, the purest kind of discovery. So that in coaching, we really want to be able to help the individual understand how they can discover their own answer. You and me and most people, as far as I know, are much more apt to learn something if we discover it than if we force feed them. And that in a nutshell is what coaching is really all about versus 
management, which is a different skill and very, very much needed, and we need managers in, work, in organizations. But management is usually about coordinating and telling people what to do. Coaching is really a process by which we help them uncover their own answers. The other skills, reframing, is a way in which we help people see things from a different perspective. I don't think that people change a behavior until they change their, their uh, perceptions. The notion is that behavior follows perception. If that were not the case, then just go read a book and figure out how to become a multimillionaire tomorrow because that's what the book told you to do. We don't make those results happen in our lives because we haven't changed our core beliefs, our core, our core perceptions, even though our mind might know differently. So coaching is a way to help unlock that and finding out the unsaid, the unspoken, and the unknown. And when that coach can help that individual get to that kind of clarity, then actions can really start to take forth. Truthful feedback, briefly, is just a way of providing that person the kind of honest feedback in a safe environment so that person can see that which they cannot necessarily see themselves. And then lastly is all around requesting, people getting into action. I truly believe that coaching, when it really works, is about discovery, about self-awareness, and about getting people into action on those new awarenesses. And it's a very trusted relationship. And as a result of this particular class, you will have an actual experience around coaching will have me helping you be the coach. You'll have the tools in which to do this in a format. And um, you can actually start some coaching sessions yourself, and we'll talk about how to do that. The next slide here is part of that process. I mean, where we guide people through um, those ways in which we want to organize these, these coaching sessions. We want to talk about what the outcome is that the particular coaching client is. We want to talk about... Um, what sort of information do we need to gather in order to help that particular person? We want to develop a strategy around helping them moving forward. And we also want to know what, what good looks like, what success looks like, what does results look like. I do want you to know that you do not necessarily have to be a coach in a company. You can be a coach for a friend. There's different kind of coaches. There's life coaches, the productivity coaches, there's leadership coaches. Um, it doesn't really necessarily matter, but I want to make sure that everybody has a sense of that coaching is something that you can learn, you can pick up. And this, this particular program is really about 50 years in the making and it continues to evolve, but it's, it's very interactive and very exciting. And again, I would just say uh, before we move on to the next class is just think about the next time you're listening to somebody, try and listen without judgment, ask questions without answers. All right, so let's move on to the next one if we could. This was really about um, how to stand out with a leadership brand. Um, the story on this one was my very, very first workshop that I ever did up in Seattle, Washington, when this company started uh, many years ago, I guess it was back in 1992. And I did this little class called Discover Your Life's Purpose. It was probably a four hour course, one of those extension classes that you would find at you know, the grocery store. And uh, it was something that I was quite passionate about. It was part of my training and it really took off. And it was something that um, I, I've always been working on and developing over these many years. And um, it, it really is the foundation of what I believe is that you can discover and live your life's purpose at work, not just when you're on your two week vacation in Maui. And I think that is a possibility. I'm not saying it's easy, but I definitely am playing for that kind of uh, goal that, to be able to help people do that. This particular course is really all about authentic leadership, ultimately creating what we would call a leadership brand. It is about self-understanding. It's about understanding your stories and what it is that you have been telling yourself since you were born and what does those stories seem to tell you about where you are now. It's about understanding your values, not from a standpoint of what's present, but sometimes from a standpoint of what's not present. Sometimes when we are in a situation we don't like, it's because the value that we so much adhered to is not present. We can't express it. And so therefore, we go through a little bit of work on that. We talk about, um, if you would please move to the next slide, Melanie will go through the whole model, but I'll give you a quick overview. Of this. The next uh, piece is really about energy and edge. I mean, how do you then decide when is no and when is yes? I would say that if you're going to be an authentic leader, not everything can be a yes. Because if we say yes to everything, then we're allowing certain things into our life that we don't necessarily value or want to adhere to. So it's about really drawing a line in the sand around certain things. I think that at some point, if you are in a company and you've done good work and you're working hard and you're eventually getting noticed 
at that point, the organization starts to pile on more and more things for you to do, which is wonderful because you're being noticed for that, but you can also get yourself into a burnout situation pretty quickly. It's that transition from being the individual contributor to being the leader of many that sometimes people have a hardest time because they have to abandon what made them successful in the past, but they at the same time, they have to start learning to be coaches and, and coordinators and so forth and authentic in that. That's the time when you need to learn how to say no. And that's sometimes very difficult for people who are so much about service. Um, just briefly here, too, we also talk about the strengths that you and I have, that if we do those strengths at the wrong time or if we do it too much, they become a derailer. I am a very, very tenacious person. I love getting stuff done. But when my stress starts to hit me, I become a bit of a bird dogger. I can overdo it. I have, to, I, mean, I have some wonderful people in my life that tell me, hey, Dean, you're being the bird dogger. I have to tone it down. And so we are able to um, identify what are the strengths that when stress or sometimes boredom comes into our lives that we are, have a tendency towards overdoing it or using that strength in the wrong way. There's a guy right now I'm coaching who's a CEO of a healthcare system. And one of his particular strengths is that he's bold. And boldness is wonderful. We need that. And he does a very good job of, of being a bold thinker and thinking outside the box. However, when he gets stressed out, he ends up becoming less self-aware and his boldness becomes more like um, he's pushing too hard and he doesn't realize his own weaknesses and his own um, limitations. And so that's one of the things that happen with that particular strength of boldness when it's overdone, it becomes, you know, a little bit of a lack of awareness around how you are, um, you know, you're falling down in some areas. We also talk a little bit about integrated life, you know, that's work-life balance stuff. We, we, we briefly touch upon that, but I really believe that's an important piece of this. We can't serve people if we can't serve ourselves. The board of directors piece is really your network. Who do you connect with? There's a great book called The Medici Effect that talks about the cross-pollination of the different industries and how that creates wonderful innovations. Are we networking within our silos or are we networking outside our silos? And then if we... Um, the last piece of this is obviously around your leadership brand. That is the, the statement that really defines the big, hairy, audacious goals that you want to accomplish, but it also clarifies what you believe. If you've ever seen the, the wonderful TED Talk by Simon Sinek, he talks about people don't follow you by what you do or how you do it. They follow you why you do what you do. And if you don't know why you do what you do, then nobody else will be able to follow you. So we really finish up this particular day with a really powerful, brand statement. If OSU and Nike and other large organizations can have brand statements, if leaders could have that kind of clarity, that kind of potency, others will want to follow them because what you believe in is also what I believe in. And I want to be on that particular ship. I want to be able to follow that. I want to be able to be a part of that. It's in a sense creating like a little movement. So wonderful particular um, program. We love doing it. We've been doing it with the Mayo Clinic for quite a few years and other organizations, and we've just gotten some tremendous results out of this. And it really has pr provided a good foundation for leaders to develop their own, their own course of action. Uh, so I guess the, um, the tip on this one um, is, you know, what do you believe that is, um, you know, a belief statement, you know, things around your work, around your leadership, that you think is, is a belief statement, not a goal, not an outcome, not a measurement, but what are the things that you really believe to be holding true? And if you can identify that and clarify that in a sentence or two and start to populate that and start to share that with people and see who actually believes the same things you believe, you're gonna start seeing some eyebrows go up. I mean, like for example, as I said before, I really believe that people can discover and live their life's purpose at work, not necessarily just when they're on their two week trip to Hawaii. I think that's true. I've seen it happen. I believe that, and I want to be about that. And when I, the more I talk about that, the more people go, hmm, interesting idea. I think I want to sign up for that. So that's just one of my beliefs, and I'm sure you have many, but identify maybe a couple of your core beliefs when it comes to your career, when it comes to the way in which you like to work with people or your leadership. All right, so the next one up, if we could. Yes, of course. Sorry, I was trying to, uh, to weave in some questions here, and my mouse jumped yeah. a little ahead. But we had oh, a great no worries, question. No we had a great Please. question that really pertains to this section that you were talking about. So, one of the listeners today is a, a low-level employee on a large national company and is trying to implement servant leadership. Um, however, management does not act in a way that empowers her or her colleagues um, on uh, what basically to so. Uh, 
it, uh, management isn't acting in a way that, that empowers her. Um, so is there a tip that you could give to how uh, she could communicate with her supervisor? Hopefully this didn't jump too far. Uh, supervisors about walking the walk. Well, that's a great question. It's certainly one that I've heard before. And it's obviously uh, much, more, much more complicated than, than we would have time to unpack and, un and understand. But I think that mm -hmm. you have to speak in the language of the person who you're trying to influence. So if you do a person, for example, who's all about numbers and all about data and all about getting business results, then can you make a case for how servant leadership will help them do that? But you can't necessarily come right out and say, hey, I want to be a servant leader and we, we should support that and we need to be able to have this training program or bring in these coaches to help us learn how to do this. That alone may not make the case. But if you can draw the connection between how does servant leadership, which is really about service to other people. And what does service to other people do? Well, if you think about, if you ever look up the service profit chain, if you Google that, you'll know that when you have employees who provide better service to each other, they ultimately provide better service to their clients, whether they be you know, external or internal. And those particular outcomes eventually start to hit quality metrics. They start hitting financial metrics. And it becomes a business case when you can draw the line between the different checkpoints, if you will. So my suggestion for this person asking that question is, is start with their major hot buttons, that individual, the leader, whomever, if it's about finances, if it's about results, if it's about productivity, whatever their hot button is, and, and do a little time and strategize, maybe bring some other people in and find a way to be able to link the the actual experience of being a servant leader to those outcomes, now all of a sudden you're changing their perception, you're helping them see that if we do servant leadership in this particular way, we're gonna see some bottom line results if that is in fact what they're all about. It does take some time, but I would say speak in the language of the person who you're trying to influence and draw those connections. Excellent. That's a great question. Yeah, other questions, please let them fire up. All right, so as the questions are coming through, do you want to talk a little bit about the next um, course in the series? Please, yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and uh, I really appreciate this, um, this exchange. This is really how I like to work. I love to be able to have the conversation. My teaching style is not the professor who's in front of the room. I, I am very much about a small group, group interactions. We do a lot of uh, simulations. We do a lot of hands-on learning by doing activities and i really believe that the knowledge the transformation in the room is with you all it's not with me i'm just the guide who's helping create the pathway to get you there um we have a lot of fun i have a background in theater i got my professional acting training degree from the university of washington at the end of that i went you know what i don't want to be an actor i want to be a facilitator i want to create some of these uh, kinds of environments we had uh, i learned about in theater and, and transform that into business so this particular course is, is around communicating through social style agility. There's a lot of different style and personality and, and aptitude assessments in the market right now. There's Myers-Briggs, there's Two Colors, there's, there's Kobe, there's um, the PI, and you may have these. We really landed on this one around social styles, and we really, we kind of taken it to the next step and morphed it and changed it a little bit over the years, but it, we love it because it's easy to understand and it's quick to apply. So if I can wait, I can describe this, is that what we're doing here in this particular assessment and the training that goes around it is for people to really understand what their style preference is. And it doesn't say that, it doesn't mean that you don't have many different abilities, but what do you prefer? What's that pair of jeans you just love to wear on a Saturday morning? What gives you energy? And so this is really all about being able to remove the chatter, the static between people. Google is now saying in their research that people are making a snap judgment about you or me in under a second. And that's part of the fact that we're in this attention deficit economy. We have the expectation that we will get an immediate response because Twitter and Facebook and our cell phones and all the other technology we have has been training us to expect that. But when it comes to interactions with people, we are also expecting to be able to make a very quick snap judgment about somebody. 97% of all communication is nonverbal. And so how you behave and how you act is either gonna connect with people or it's not. And so social style agility in this particular training 
is really having you understand what it is your preference regarding how you like to communicate, what happens when you're stressed out, how you like to make decisions. So that's one outcome is that self-knowledge. The other thing is, even with other people not taking this particular assessment that we do in class, you will begin to be able to see and identify what the style is of other people. So for example, as a tip, maybe you think about is who's the person that you normally have a really easy time connecting with? You guys just clicked first time, no problem. And then my assessment is, in some ways, you probably have a style that's similar to each other because that other person reminds you of you and you love you, so you yeah, gotta love them. If there's a connection, there's a, there's a familiarity, a familiarity of self and somebody else. Styles are lined up. But conversely, there may be a person in your life, I'm sure, that you have always had a hard time connecting with. You know, and so that's the, maybe where their styles are somewhat different. And so the way I kind of describe this in class is that there's a difference between your content, which is the message, and the style by which it's being delivered. Joanne, my wife, wanted cowboy boots from Sundance this last Christmas. So I went and got her these boots. They were beautiful. She loved them. I knew she would love them because she told me. So, so that, in a sense, is the, the analogy of the cowboy boots is the, the content in our communication. Now, if I had wrapped that, those boots in a box, you know, with some really ugly paper with a dilapidated bow, she probably would have looked at it and go, hmm, I don't know if I like this. And that's the same way. The, the wrapping around the gift is our style. And so if your style does not align with somebody else, they will most likely not pay attention to you, especially in this fast-paced world of attention deficit. So this particular course is really about being able to develop ultimately the awareness of your style, the awareness of other people, and when appropriate, knowing how with strategy and practice in the class, how to change your style and change your approach, change your behavior so it's more like the other person. I'll tell you a quick story and then I want to hear some more comments and, and questions here. So my style, I mean, we can go through this and Melanie, if you'd be so kind and, and uh, go to the next slide is that my style in the bottom right is expressive. I am a big picture, creative, fast paced individual who has a need for recognition and approval, who is really good on socializing and I'm not necessarily great when it checks details and when my stress is high, I can kind of become a little bit protective of my self-esteem. That's my style, that's my preference. It's easy, doesn't mean that I can't do the other styles, it just means it's easy. So when stress comes into my life, I kind of hang on that and you all have your own style as well. So the story that I want to quickly tell you is many years ago when we were living in Seattle, I was doing a um, presentation for a group of law, no, accountants at Grant Thornton. And I walk into this room, big, you know, conference table and people are in button down three piece suits and, you know, the women were all professional and we all came together and I was in front of this, this uh, board and I had to have five minutes to pitch our little company on a sales training course that we wanted them to buy. Well, meanwhile, out in the lobby, there's three or four other companies waiting their turn to do the same thing. So I'm sitting there and I'm standing there and I'm starting to do my presentation. And because I am who I am, my style is expressive. My style is big picture. I am moving around. I'm using my hands. I'm using inflection in my voice. I'm telling stories. I'm trying to be funny. I'm doing the things that make it easy for me. And I notice that the audience is actually not paying attention. They start looking at their watch, they start looking away, they're looking bored. And I go, oh my gosh, I'm losing them, this is a tough crowd. So then I thought, well, if a little bit of my energy is not working, maybe a lot of my energy will make it work. So I end up cranking up the volume, cranking up the energy, cranking up my, my style, and they only went more and more reserved. And then I got to the presentation that was about teaching them around social style agility. And I realized that I was doing the exact thing I was going to teach them not to do. I was applying a style that was not reflective of the style in the room, which was much more, if you think of this page on the, on the computer, much more analytical. It's more about facts and information and details and, and history and accuracy and, and a kind of a nonverbal communication that was more subdued. Once I realized that, I slowed everything down, I stopped walking around so fast, stopped telling those dumb corny jokes, stopped using my hands to gesture. I went to the flip chart and I pulled out a pen 
and I started writing figures. And the figures represented cost savings in a company that we were able to help and the money back guarantee and the rate of sales that went up as a result of this program for this company. And once I started talking in a language that they were familiar, they then started to pay attention and they asked questions. And although I was uncomfortable, I was able to communicate with them and they were able to hear. So our styles were meshing. We got the gig. It was a 20 minutes of me sweating, but who cares? We got the gig. It was a nice you know, book of business for a while there. So communication style agility. We do this a lot. We've done it hundreds of times. This is a very popular program. I was just in Cincinnati and I did this for a group. Um, I was up and uh, worked with a lawyer group. We've done this with large groups, small groups in different countries. It's a very, very powerful process that takes people through to be able to have some self-discovery, understand how they can actually create better communication with people, specifically with different styles on their own. So we have more tolerance. We have more engagement with people. And so um, very popular course. and um, You'll love it. It's a lot of fun and very, very much about, you know, walking away with those tools and, and you'll be able to apply them that very day. So questions. What have we got so far, Melanie, that's showing up on your board? Yeah. So uh, one came in about a delicate. Can you talk about the delicate balance between employees and supervisors and um, kind of maybe relating to social social style? Was that the question regarding social style? Mm hmm. Okay, got it. Well, I don't know the whole context of the person's question, so I'll just take a stab at this. Um, so the, the kind of front loading was um, maybe treating them as human beings, not robots. Um. No. <laughs> so is that the, the supervisor treating the employee as, as human beings, not robots? <laughs> well, I think yeah. if I'm the if I'm the if I'm the supervisor, um, uh, obviously, you know, my success is going to be totally incumbent on the success of the people that I work with and the people that I lead. And so if I am, if we're just taking the, the pathway around social styles, my job hopefully would be is to understand what the style preferences are of each of my particular team members and be able to communicate to them accordingly. I got one person who's all about being a driver, wants results, is uh, likes control. I'm not going to come into my employee's office and sit around and talk about the cats and dogs, the kids and the fish. I'm going to come in there and say, the next thing that we're going to do, here's the game plan in and out. And it's going to be a lot more direct, but that works for that particular employee. Another employee might want to socialize more. The amiable on the bottom left-hand side. It's all about relationship security. So I go into that person's office and say, so how are the kids? What did you do over the weekend? Let's, talk, let's see those grandkids. And then we have conversations. And we ease into work through relationships versus start right off. And so I think that uh, that's how I would say if you're the supervisor is you really do definitely need to understand that one size does not fit all. Uh, you have to be agile. You have to be flexible if you're going to be able to, to engage people the most. Because engagement is really part of the outcome here. So when we have engaged employees, engaged leaders, then we increase our learning. And I, was, I read a quote recently, maybe I've already mentioned this on this call, but if the speed of learning is not faster than the speed of change, you're going to fall behind. Whether that's an employee who's brand new to a company, a student, whether it's uh, a, a, somebody who owns their own small business or works for a large business, the speed of change is so fast right now that we have to get really good at learning as fast as that change. Style diversity, style flexibility, creating that tolerance and understanding the differences is what makes us stronger, not makes us more divisive, is where we want to go. And that increases that engagement, which ultimately increases better learning. And better learning actually has, for those people who are about that, creates better productivity, bottom line results, and real value for even shareholders and the like. It all connects. Great question. Yeah, great question. So another one came in about when leaders fail, what's usually the biggest cause? Lack of self-awareness. That's the biggest one. Um, if you don't know thyself, then how can you possibly change it? And by the time a leader fails, it's usually because they've had several opportunities to pay attention to some issues that have come up and they haven't stepped back and done a, an, aware, an assessment around, you know, what can I learn here? So. 
I think the, the biggest failure, one of them, there's certainly many of them we could talk about, but really a big one is I just am not paying attention. I'm not paying attention to myself. I'm not paying attention to what I do and how it affects other people. I'm not reading the cues, and some of those cues are very subtle. I'm not reading the tea leaves, so to speak. I'm not paying attention to the outside world and how it's affecting us. I think it all comes down to, in the, in the end, it comes down to, do I have self-awareness? Conversely, can I take that self-awareness and translate that into learning and ultimately into action? Um, that's what I, uh, what I see. Excellent. Who should be in the program? Uh, we've identified managers, maybe uh, people that are interested in becoming managers, supervisors or coordinators or people leading the team, um, those that are interested in developing those leadership skills. So if you're not yet a leader, um, it's, it's the perfect time to hone before you're actually you know, the emergency leader and leading the team. Um, and so understanding your, your authentic style and, um, and your leadership style pre-leadership pre is, is the key. So do you have any other identified audiences, Dean, that you could see could benefit? No, I think you're right. And I think that sometimes people, when, I, when they take a course from us or they work for the company, they say, you know, uh, Dean, I don't really have any direct reports. How can I take your course without that? And it, I don't think that's a problem at all. Um, we work with small companies. We work with some of them as big as ExxonMobil, and we have that question come up. This is really also about life skills and that you can translate that in many many ways we were not focusing on how you become a better parent but i think that's one of the things that happens sometimes or how you better become a better friend or a partner these things are transferable the other thing i would say is in terms of leadership is that yes maybe you're not a leader today maybe you don't have the title of leader you don't have the uh individual contributors who are coming up to you and saying you're my boss maybe that's the case but maybe at one point you will you know, and um, there is so much evidence right now that says that if you behave and you act as a leader, you will be seen as a leader. And it's nothing that you need to wait to be tapped on the shoulder. Start behaving that way. Start thinking that way. Start having that strategic vision. Start getting really good at, at what's your point of view around leadership, your leadership brand, your communication style, your coaching. Get really good at that. And so that when it's time to look for a new person to uh, promote, you will stick out because you're already acting like a leader. And so um, I just wanted to accentuate that because sometimes people feel like they're not ready for this. I think we, could, we, we, we do do that. We have people who are, uh, come through these courses who are, you know, have no direct reports, and we also have people who have headed up um, you know, large companies and they have leaders under them and leaders under them. Um, very much so. Last thing I'll say is that we do have a pretty clear curriculum and agenda. I am very much of the, of the mindset that if there's a particular topic that is really taking root in our conversation, in our exercises, and we need to spend more time with that and less time with something else, then that's what we do. It is, I, don't, I am not um, uh, really um, formalized in saying we have to finish this conversation exactly now. I want to go with a that. I want to go where the, the insight is, where the discovery is, and that's going to come from people like you. And we'll, we'll follow your lead based on the energy in the room. So uh, we had another question about um, employee engagement. So how do you jumpstart employee engagement in order to keep them engaged? How do you jumpstart employee engagement in order to keep them, them being the employee, engaged? Okay, so I guess what I'm trying to get out of that is it sounds like how do we – how do we engage employees? <laughs> if, I, if I can sort of um, decipher what that question is. Um, mm -hmm. If I'm a leader and I want to engage my employee, I would want to find out um, a, f a few things. Um, one, I got to develop a relationship with these people. I want to know uh, what makes them tick. I want to know what their social style is. That would be one thing. I want to understand uh, a little bit about their background, their, their personal life, but ultimately, I want to know what are their goals, what turns them on, uh, what is it that really um, provides value to them. And then once I have some understanding about what that is, then let's find ways to be able to um, bring more opportunities so they can fulfill on that. There's a great book, another tip if you guys want. It's called Drive by Daniel Pink. He did a lot of research on research of motivation, which is another way of saying engagement. And he discovered research that people are engaged or motivated 
not by the typical carrot and stick approach. Let's reward you or punish you, but more by three things, uh, autonomy, mastery, and purpose. And that is those three things that he felt, and I think he's got something here, around what really can motivate and ultimately engage people. So in the end, it is about aligning the individual to things that they are passionate about, removing the barriers to those particular activities, and really be a champion for that individual. If they don't know what really turns them on, then at least by developing the relationship and the process and meeting on occasion to ask those questions shows tremendous interest. Um, another tip and tool is check out the Gallup Q12 um, assessment that came out several years ago. The 12 of the seven of the 12 questions, by the way, around what engages employees based on a 7,800 uh, member survey, I think it's that number, don't quote me on that one, had to do with relationships at work. Like I have a best friend at work, I have somebody who really cares about me and so forth. So engagement ultimately is a relationship function and aligning the individual to their passion. And if you can help people do that, that'll help them become more engaged. Thank you again for your time. Thank you everybody for attending and thanks Dean. Thank you so much. I appreciate everyone's time. Um, if you wanna check out our website, that's the one way you can also ask a question of me. The site will be updated here pretty soon, but nonetheless, I just wanna make sure of myself and I know Melanie, you as well are making yourself available for any questions and comments. So I'd uh, love to keep the conversation going.